So I wrote this blog post on enumeration a few days ago, and it was about a particular behavior with enumeration that really sort of sparked people's interest, kind of uh, terrified some of us, if I'm honest. But anyway, raised a bunch of issues. People had questions about how do we deal with enumeration of accounts on websites? And this is one of the topics I normally do in my workshops, and we spend quite a bit of time talking about the ins and outs of enumeration. So I thought what I'd do is just record what I'd normally talk about in the workshop and put it out there on the blog. And I think some people will probably find this quite interesting. So let me sort of start from the, the beginning with enumeration. And I'll give you a really good example of what I mean by this. In 2015, there was a breach of a website which disclosed a lot of rather sensitive personal data. I want to show you what that website was. We'll jump over to here. Uh, somewhat alarming that it is in my history, but there is a good reason for this. Now, in case you're looking at this and saying adult friend finder, well, friends are nice, maybe it's a social network. It may not be the kind of social network you're used to. Maybe it is, I don't know, let's not cast judgment. The point is, is that this is a website very similar to Ashley Madison. And when they got hacked in 2015, people got very upset that other people could find out if they had an account on the site or not. But at the time, I sort of lamented that really you didn't need to get hacked in order to discover whether someone's on AFF or not. And I'll show you what I mean. If we jump on over to the forgot password page, and we're going to fat finger an alias here, and then I'm going to put in a Mailinator address. And if Mailinator is new to you, you'll see why it's significant in a moment. At Mailinator in a tour.com. Uh, now, here's what we'll do. We'll put in uh, 880 like so. We'll submit. And it comes back and it's, it's kind of explicit, right? Uh, this is an invalid email address. So this is not kind of, we're not sure if you're on the site or not. It's pretty explicit. This account is not on the site. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this. I'm going to change it to a research account. Now, this is research, folks. It does have a valid research purpose. And that account is NDC 2015. And in fact, I sent it to notmailinator.com. I'm going to copy that on the clipboard. The significance of that will make sense in a moment. Solve the super hard capture just here. Submit the page. And here we go. Now, this is kind of implicit, but what it is saying is that that account exists on this website. And that's enumeration, right? So this is pretty straightforward. What it's now done is it's demonstrated that we can tell whether an account exists on the site or not. We just need to know the email address. Okay, so now that we've established that, let's do this. Let's jump on over to mailinator.com. And if you're unfamiliar with Mailinator, the joy of it is that it lets you send mail to any address you like at mailinator.com and then be able to check the mailbox publicly. Now, this is really handy when there's a, a gateway, if you like, where you need to be able to demonstrate that you can receive an email to an address and after that, they let you through. Now, you would have noticed I used uh, an address at not mailinator.com because some sites block Mailinator.com because it is there for throwaway accounts. Mailinator knows this. So if you scroll down a bit, what you'll see is that they always have these alternate addresses that you can send a mail to and still check it here on Mailinator, uh, which is kind of cool. Now, they don't publish what all the addresses are because they don't want anyone harvesting them and then saying, OK, well, we're going to block these, you know, 100 odd domains, whatever it is. But be that as it may, I can now go up here and I can check the mailbox for notmailinator.com and we should have an email from Adult Friend Finder, your reset password request. And here we go. Now, of course, most of the time when we're going to be checking someone's account, the theory, if you like, is that they're going to say, well, you know, maybe it's a jealous wife checking if her husband has an Adult Friend Finder account. And then this tab alone would have established the fact that, yes, he does. Interestingly, though, when we actually have a look at this Mailinator email, I kind of like the message here because it's sort of like another member may have entered your username by mistake. Well, yes, <laughs> that's possible. Uh, your wife may have entered it rather deliberately as well. Uh, so there's always that. But anyway, this is really the point back here. The point is 
we get this positive confirmation, does the account exist or not? Now let's think about two extremes for a moment. So uh, adult friend finder, there is an expectation of privacy. If you create an account on a site like this, you're expecting that other people won't find out if you, or rather if you do, actually have the account or not. Uh, Ashley Madison, same thing. Ashley Madison had a similar risk, and I blogged about this uh, around about the time that I hacked in 2015. And their risk was a little bit more subtle. You got differently formatted responses if the account existed or not. But same deal, classes of website where you have an expectation of privacy. Now let's turn this around. What if it was, say, Stack Overflow? So if I have an account on Stack Overflow and my wife finds out, am I going to be upset? Well, you know, no. Uh, she may not know what it is, but it's not going to be something that causes me any discomfort or, or harm. Same with my boss or prospective employers or anything like that. So enumeration here matters less. When we get to the really big stuff, the Facebooks, the Ebays, the PayPals of the world, it's almost the norm for someone to have an account. In fact, it's a bit of an exception if you say, hey, look, this, this address actually doesn't have an account. So they tend to have enumeration risks, but they matter a lot less than Adult Friend Finder. Now let's have a look at something else, and this is sort of going to bring us to the point of why I wrote that blog post. We have this particular site here, strawberrynet.com. And whilst I was running this workshop uh, only last week, someone pointed me here. Part of the workshop exercise was go around, have a look at the way different sites disclose if you have an account or not. So if you go and reset your own password, for example, does it tell you that you have an account on the site? Now I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> obfuscate some of this video for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. But let me show you the, let's just say ingenuity for the moment behind this process. So here's what we'll do. We'll go down and go, okay, uh, hey, this looks cool. Let's buy some of this perfume here. Okay, very good. We're going to buy now. Let's just go and check out straight away. Now, it's asking for an email address. Okay, fine. I am going to choose a girl's name at gmail.com. And I'm just going to choose a rather common girl's name. And of course, the chances of someone being on that name at gmail.com are very high. And then it's just a question of whether they have an account on this site. Let's go check out. Now, here is the problem. I have obfuscated this person's full name, their full address, their phone number. It's like everything about the person is here. And you can enumerate through and just keep picking people. If you were to throw a large list of email addresses at this site and just automate it, all right, so you script it up, figure out what the request to this path was, uh, submit different email addresses, look at the response, you could harvest huge amounts of data. And I, I guess the thing that kind of blew us all away is that when I actually wrote about this, it was after someone had already reported this to the organization. Uh, so they reported this to the organization and they had some really interesting things to say. Uh, so first of all, they said, well, we do actually have uh, SSL, S.S.L. And that's going to make it secure, which basically means you can just harvest all the data out of it and not be intercepted by a man in the middle, which really isn't what we'd actually like out of this. Uh, so that was a problem. And what then came up in the comments on this blog is that uh, other people had actually contacted them even a decade ago. And they've said, well, actually, our customers really like this feature. And it's, it's really interesting, in fact, in this uh, particular quote here, they say, using your email address as your password is sufficient security. I don't think they quite get it. <laughs> there was a follow up a little bit later on where someone actually asked for their data to be removed. And StrawberryNet came back and, and talked about PCI, which has got absolutely nothing to do with what we've just seen here. So all of this is kind of nuts and crazy on, on a level that you really rarely see. But I don't want to focus too much on StrawberryNet. Let's talk more about enumeration because this is kind of the point of being here. Let me give you an example of uh, enumeration that I like, an enumeration defense 
that I like. Now there's an interesting site over here called uh, Entropay. And Entropay does virtual credit cards. And what I really like about their approach is this. Let's do this. We'll go for a forgot password. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fat finger this and I'm going to give it a bit of Mailinator again. Mailinator.com like so. Put that in the clipboard so we can check it in a moment and then submit. Now this address doesn't exist. But what Entropay has said is email sent. We've sent you an email at blah, 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 blah with further instructions. Now here's the thing. Whether the account exists on Entropay or not, you get exactly the same response. There's nothing to differentiate the two responses. So think about this from an enumeration perspective. Someone external to the system looking at this, just guessing email addresses. This feature is not going to tell them whether the account exists or not. Now, if we then jump over to Mailinator, what we'll find is that if we check this mailbox, we will indeed have an email, account access attempted. And what it will then say is, however, this email address is not in our database of registered users. Now, this is good. Some people say you should give the same message regardless of whether the account exists or not, just like this message here, but then only send an email if it does. Now, the reason I don't like that is because I don't always remember which email address I used. Or I do these days because I tend to just use the one, but in days gone by, I'd have my corporate work address and I'd have my personal address. Some people have multiple personal addresses. And I would much rather get this email, which is explicit and tells me that this is not the account that I used on this site, rather than sitting there wondering, is it just delayed email delivery? Did it go to junk? Did I get the wrong account? If I get this straight away, I can action it much more effectively. So this is a good UX pattern. And the reality of it is, the number of times people try to reset passwords and the account doesn't exist is probably going to be some single digit percentage of the overall password resets. So it's not like you're wasting valuable email or anything like that. So this is good. I like this. What I would do differently, just going back to Entropay and going back to the actual reset page, I would have anti-automation here because you don't want to have a situation where someone can just grab a whole heap of email addresses and even though this page doesn't disclose whether they exist on the system or not I don't want them making a bunch of requests posting the data to this feature and causing emails to be sent. Someone jumps up with a million email addresses and an axe to grind and it starts really messing with your spam reputation which affects your delivery and affects your cost of actually sending the emails as well. So I'd be having a recapture on here. Uh, and I'll give you a good example of what I mean by this because I don't necessarily mean crazy squiggly letters that drive you nuts. I mean doing something like I use on my site over here at Have I Been Pwned. And this is pretty straightforward. I have the ability here for notifications and I have a recapture like so. And in this case, it's actually challenged me. Uh, normally it would just tick the box unless it's not quite confident enough in who you are. In which case it says, click bicycles, yoink, 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 and hopefully we're done, good. So that's usually the worst that this experience is. Now this is Google's recapture 2. It's a free implementation. And having that on a page like this means we don't run the risk of someone just throwing huge numbers of addresses at this. So we, we have an anti-automation protection. So that's what I'd be adding here. But this is just password reset. And there are two other vectors that we commonly see used for enumeration. One of those vectors is registration. So this is actually a good example over here. This is registration for a feature. And the way that you protect against enumeration on a registration feature is the same as the way you'd protect against it in a password reset feature. And it's just simply that you need to give the same response to the user. Now, in a case like this, it's pretty simple. It's just an email address. So you enter an email address and whether it exists or does not exist, you get exactly the same response in the user interface. You have to. Anything short of that and you've got the enumeration risk. But what it then means is that you get different emails. So the email, sending an email that is, is used as a side channel. 
So another channel that's separate to the web interface here. So I sent two before to different email addresses, uh, one which didn't exist in the system, one which did. And I'll show you what they look like. Now, here's the first one I sent. And this one has gone to uh, an address which I don't presently have subscribed. I sent it to Troy Hunt at haveibeenpwned.com. And this email is exactly what you'd expect to a new registrant of a system. Uh, there's a verification link here and a little bit of a welcome and explanation about uh, what the service is. So all of that is just fine. Now, if I was to compare this to an email sent to an address that is already registered, we get this. So the one on the right. Now, the one on the right has gone to my normal account. And in fact, in this case, it said uh, you or possibly someone else, because anybody can enter anybody's email address, just subscribe it however you're actually subscribed or ready for breach notifications. Now, this was a simplistic form. So this one just here, where all we had to do was enter an email address. And very often on registration, you're going to ask for a bunch more data. The process is the same, though. You're sending an email, and you ultimately have two different email templates. One which says, welcome, and the other one which says, hey, look, you've already got an account. Now, some people will argue that it's a bit of a usability anti-pattern in that latter case. You know, why send an email? Why not just tell you on the website? And the reality of it is that it kind of doesn't really change much work-wise. You've still got to fill out the forms. You've still got to press the submit button. We're just using email now as this verification channel. I've heard people in the past say, we have actually done studies. And studies show that we have a higher retention rate or conversion rate or whatever it is if we tell people in the interface whether the account exists or not. And honestly, if that's the case, then great. You know, make your own decision. It's not to say that every single system should do this, but you have to make a decision about how important privacy is. And if it's not important enough and the value of retention or conversion or whatever is high enough, then fine, go with that route make it an explicit decision. It shouldn't just be a default position. Let's just show information in the user interface and jeopardize privacy because reasons. <laughs> you know, you've got to have good reasons that are properly thought out. So that's registration and that is also the password reset. The other one that you often see enumeration in is login. And I'll give you a really good example that drives me nuts. <laughs> so have a look at this one. If I go to about and I go to user voice, and when we get over to the user voice here, uh, there's the ability to sign in. There's something kind of interesting that happens after we go sign in and we fat finger this, can be anything, and I stop typing, and then it just says your name. And what they're really saying here is, we don't have an account for you. Would you like to create one? Enter a name. And in fact, if we hit F12 and we look at the dev tools, we look at the network requests and we change this to something else, we'll see that there's a nice little API here, which does a lookup. And you can just hit this API and it will tell you immediately whether the account exists or not. If the account does exist, then the response comes back and says, hey, enter your password and you log in. So this is a good example of enumeration on the actual login. And look, I mean, really, this is an easy fix. And the fix is simply when you go to a login page, normally you would enter both your username and your password. And the system comes back and says, credentials incorrect. Might be username, might be password. I'm not going to tell you. You've got to work it out for yourself. So that's a simple fix. And in a case like this, look, honestly, it's, it's such an unintuitive implementation. I don't know that you can even make a UX argument for it. But clearly, you can see the enumeration risk. But by the same token, it's user voice. It's not going to cause me any great discomfort if someone discovers that I have an account. In fairness, though, if it was something like a bank, it may not be a discomfort issue. But is this now a possible vector to social engineering? So, for example, if you can confirm that someone has an account on a banking website, can you as a hacker or as someone with malicious intent, possibly socially engineer them. We know that you have an account on this site. You're overdrawn, you need to renew your card, whatever. Something is made up and that then contributes to the phishing attack because you know that the person does actually have an account there. 
So in a case like finance, there is certainly an expectation of privacy. We're talking about money. And there is a risk if you disclose. Now, there's one other interesting thing here as well that's worthwhile noting. And uh, let's just see if we can do this one. We'll, we'll try... Uh, We'll try Ashley Madison, who uh, surprisingly have gone very, very classy at recent times, at least compared to before. And they're kind of upping the image. But there's an interesting thing that happens on Ashley Madison uh, when you go to log in. And uh, I won't actually log in here because there are things behind the login page which aren't really suitable for a, a tutorial of this type. But when you do attempt to log in, look at the timing. Look at how long it takes for an account that doesn't exist versus an account that does. Go and create a research account. Make sure you call it research. So you create a research account. Have a look at how long it takes. Because Ashley Madison, as we now know, because all their code was dumped publicly, uses Bcrypt for hashing. And Bcrypt is slow. It's good that it's slow. But it's slow enough that you can observe the timing delays between an account that doesn't exist and consequently no hash is created versus an account that does exist and it then hashes the password. It's found the record, it's retrieved the hash and the salt from the database and it hashes the password you provided it. There's effectively a timing attack. You can observe the difference. So in a case like this, you've got to make sure that you hash the password whether the account exists or not if enumeration is important to you. So keep that in mind as well. It's not just the explicit confirmation. Does the account exist or not? You know, we've sent an email versus we can't find you. It's all the other little observable attributes of the request and the response as well. Another one to be a little bit conscious of is think about how you do brute force protection. So imagine this. You've got a website and if you attempt to log in five times, with a particular username and wrong passwords, it locks you out. You try the sixth time, it says the account's locked out, or you slowly uh, increase the delay that you can have between requests, or you make something else in the code limit the ability to keep trying passwords. Are you only going to do that for accounts that exist in the system or accounts that don't exist as well? Because you see the problem, if you only do it for the accounts that exist, because you've got a column called retries or a column called account is locked out or something like that, and you don't do the same thing for the accounts that don't exist, now you've got another enumeration vector. So final thing on this, many of these features send emails. Password reset sends emails. Registration should send email. And incidentally, using an email on registration when it is a brand new account, is a great way of verifying whether they actually want to be on the site. You know, put that verify link in there. Going back to the one I had just before, this is great. This is really handy. Verify my email. I know that only 80% of people that actually sign up and have I been pwned want to be in there. 20% of people don't. They didn't put the email address in. Some of them probably went to spam or something like that. But there's a bunch that didn't want to be in there. So use this email as an opportunity to verify that they want to be there, particularly if you're going to then attach something valuable to the account. I discovered after I loaded the triple O web host data breach data into Have I Been Pwned that I had a triple O web host account. The only thing is I never created it. Someone else created it with my email address, attached their own website to it, and then that was it. And Triple O Webhost never verified that they actually had control of the email. So after I loaded the data into Have I Been Pwned and I got a breach notification, always nice to know it works, not what I was really expecting though. I get the breach notification and I go, um, okay, I'll just password reset my email address. So I did a password reset and now I control that person's website. So remember that this verification is actually really important. Anyway, the point I was going to make, every time you send an email address, have a think about doing something like this, way down in the bottom. This email was initiated by someone on IP address, blah, 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 blah. Find out more about this address by clicking here. And I like this because what this actually does, and this is open another tab over here, what this actually does 
is it gives us the ability to see who is messing around with our account, which is kind of important. And I actually generated this one uh, via my VPN provider. Thank you very much. This is important. After I wrote that blog post about enumeration uh, a few days ago, many people tested my account. And I do appreciate the humorous side of that. That uh, That is very nice. Thank you, for, folks. Uh, there is now a rule which deletes all those emails. But many people went and tested this. And I'm sort of going, who are these people? <laughs> Where did these emails come from? Just dropping the IP address that sent the email somewhere down into the footer, nice and subtle like this, doesn't really get in anyone's way. Great way of tracking uh, who is actually sending email on your behalf. So that's enumeration. It is one of those things that is a little bit of a softer defense. You might do it this way, you might do it that way. But it's certainly worthwhile thinking about and not just arriving at these decisions implicitly. Uh, and if you are doing what StrawberryNet is doing and just returning all this sensitive private data by entering someone's email address, definitely don't do that.